perfect Ottoman hook blade has two parts, you see. What's up, everybody? I'm the hook. And I'm the blade. And together we're, you know. Welcome to the Hook Blade Podcast, where we discuss all things Assassin's Creed. I'm your host, Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Tim. Tim, how are you doing today? Each episode, I get a little better, you know? <laughs> I'm uh, I'm also doing doing pretty great today, because I just had a wonderful time listening to Assassin's Creed Gold. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> today Today's episode, guys, we're talking about Assassin's Creed Gold. Uh, which is an audio drama, an original audio drama from Audible, set in the world of Assassin's Creed. Uh, Tim and I have both listened to this, and this episode is all about reviewing Assassin's Creed Gold, discussing it, what are our thoughts, what are the implications of its story for the future of Assassin's Creed. Uh, Tim, yeah. give me your entire thoughts on Assassin's Creed Gold in three words. Not that great. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um All right. yeah i mean well I, I mean i think we could probably start with what we liked yeah let's start with the things that were good and that we liked about it all right so i'll have you kick that off yeah i mean first of all i think that if you're going to do an assassin's creed story about a blind dude a blind assassin uh, an audio drama is literally perfect for that for obvious reasons absolutely i was like why did I never think about how smart it is to do an audio drama about a blind character? Yeah, it just makes a, sense. It's a great idea. You can't see. It's an audio drama. <laughs> it's yeah. perfect. And I mean, and going off of that too, like I think in terms of the historical main character, which is Omar. Yeah. I do think they picked a setting. Like I had no idea what the what the fuck the great recoinage was. Right. So yeah. it's it's nice that it was it was a setting that was decently interesting. Totally. And I think it's a great example of when you have these sort of transmedia facets of the Assassin's Creed universe, you can choose settings and time periods that don't make sense for a video game. No one wants to play the great recoinage, but I might listen to a story about it. Or read a comic about it. Right, exactly. And Anthony Del Col, the writer on this, he's he kind of comes from the comic side of things, doesn't he? Yeah, he. Because I remember he, we were both really into. Uh, we were excited for for Trial by Fire, the the first like comic right. series back yeah, in yeah. 2015. Yeah, that yeah that was like the big Titan Comics thing, and and he wrote Trial by Fire. I'm not sure if he wrote any arcs past that, but um, he definitely wrote Trial by Fire. So I would not be surprised based on how well. This audio drama has done for them financially. I would not be surprised to see him return or do something else for Assassin's Creed in the near future. Has it done well financially? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can pull up the thing I was looking at. It's got it's got good reviews on the Audible site, which is probably a good sign for them. Yes. Yeah, it's their it's Audible's top rated series of twenty twenty. Wow. It's the number one. Well good after good a thousand reviews and counting. Yeah, and you know what? I mean, I see the appeal. Like, I understand why uh, people would like Assassin's Creed Gold. You know what I mean? Like, even if it didn't blow yeah. me away, I didn't love it. Um, I I see where people could love it. Does that make sense? No, 100%. I mean, I, I, I feel the same way. I'm glad that people are getting enjoyment out of it. Like, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that, like, just because I didn't love it doesn't mean that other people shouldn't have fun with it. Like... And I would welcome that perspective. Like I haven't even seen anyone talking about it. So like in, in my circle, yeah. I guess. Like there hasn't like been no a one... lot of Assassin's Creed like fan community discussion. Yeah, I totally <laughs> I missed that it even came out. It seems like no one knows it exists. It's interesting because I think that audio dramas are kind of coming back into the the zeitgeist a little bit because of Audible and podcasts and things of that nature. And Assassin's Creed makes sense for that medium. And I'm always I'm always excited about pieces of media in Assassin's Creed that are at least intending to further the modern day story because that's an element of the franchise that's really important to me. And since they're always Ubisoft is really nervous about doing modern day in games every time. They're right. like, Oh, but but some of the reviewers don't like it when we do <laughs> when we do modern day stuff. They don't like it. So we're not gonna do it. This <laughs> I time. love your Ubisoft this executive is my, voice. <laughs> this is my Ubisoft voice. It's so great. <laughs> um, which isn't which isn't my impression of Eve Guillemot, which we're saving for a special occasion. Yes. I, I will say though, in that in what you just said, intended 
to move forward the modern day is a very important yeah. word there. It's very so let's talk word. about that. <laughs> wait, wait. So are we done with the things we liked? <laughs> it was the okay, setting. No, we're and, not. Okay. We're not. I also, I like Riz Ahmed. I think he does a good, mm. I like his voice. I like his accent in this. Yeah, that's um, a wrong opinion. But. <laughs> really? You didn't like Riz? No. How, what, 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 did, what was wrong with Riz? What's uh, wrong I, with Riz? He, I just, look, he's a great actor. <laughs> yeah. Riz, if you're listening, I like you. Riz, you But awesome. in this, I don't, I didn't love you. I see this is really strange to me because you usually really like when especially Assassin's Creed characters go for the stoic badass vibe. Yeah, but it's just like I don't know, it it it, it didn't it didn't find itself in the like Altair realm. It found itself in like the Connor boring realm. No, no. Altair is worse. Than, well, AC1 Altair is like a much worse iteration of stoic badass than Well, you're than wrong. Omar. Like, I think Omar, I think his voice, he was able to capture, like, the sort of thoughtful stoic badass. Like, you can tell he's choosing his words carefully. I I got the vibe of the character. Someone who's been through, like, you know, he's experienced racism and, and, you know, ableism because of his blindness. And the world that he's sort of grown up in has been kind of harsh to him. I totally bought that he's the kind of guy who just, you know, he keeps things close to the vest, so to speak. Like, he's not... He's not talking all over the place. He's not saying things that are superfluous or extra. He's just, you know, he's being calm, collected, thoughtful. I thought he did a good job. Uh, in terms of in terms of Riz Ahmed's character, I mean, spoilers yeah. for this. But even in his most, like, passionate scene with Rose, there's no emotion, it seems. Like, I don't know. That wasn't my read of it. I felt like he was... He's I, maybe I kind of relate to this a little bit more. I think he's just maybe one of those guys who's not super openly emotional. Like that can be a character. Perhaps. Too. Yeah. But even when he's angry, like there, there, there are very little times when he's like, sp- like, like the rage inside of him is coming out and there's just yeah. not a whole lot of emotion. You know, I think that that's part of what we're dealing with, like the, the medium, too. I mean, when you're yeah. trying to express rage and you're trying to express anger, like purely with your voice it's going to be a little challenging versus that is if you're a good on point. screen but yeah so like out of all the voice actors in in ac gold for me riz did the best job and i guess it's I not think... surprising because he's the like professional hollywood actor <laughs> in the cast right. and i just saw the other day an ad for um neil gaiman's the sandman riz ahmed is playing a character in that so i feel like his agent he was probably like hey set me up with audible let me just do every <laughs> yeah. audiobook I wonder if he's like a rich tech guy in that movie. In what movie? In uh, Candyman. No, no, no. Um, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. Oh, The Sandman. Yeah, Fuck. the comic. <laughs> I don't know why you. I don't know why I thought he's a Candyman. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. The no, Sandman but you're is... right though that Riz Ahmed keeps playing rich tech guys and things because Born and Venom and isn't there another one? I don't know. Well, There's he, probably well, you, another one. You you could say he's rich with life in Nightcrawler. <laughs> Okay, we all are to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, <clears throat> any other think, good things about AC Gold? I think the Rose Galloway actress did probably the best. She oh, I thought really she did fun. great too. Yeah. She was very fun to listen to. She actually, I, I bought her like emotional state the yeah. most. All so of the all of her. the historical voice actors were fairly decent. I like Isaac Newton. He's definitely a little corny. But it fit with the tone of Assassin's Creed. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a very <clears throat> like vibrant and animated voice that he he comes up with. Excrement. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciated that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also want to say I like a couple things about the way that look, and, and I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but something right. that people talk about on Assassin's Creed is how you know you can be playing as Cassandra in Odyssey, right? You can be a female warrior in. Uh, ancient Greece and people think, oh, well, in these in these Assassin's Creed games, they never want to acknowledge like actual, you know, discrimination and, and racism and sexism like those elements never factor into their historical stories. And I'm never one that <clears throat> I, I don't protest that. I think that that just makes the game more inclusive and entertaining for the most amount of people. But I liked that they had the freedom in Assassin's Creed Gold to actually, you know, there is racism against against Omar in the story yeah. and, it, and it feels like part of the world and it feels like part of his character. It's Absolutely. not ignored. Same with, with for Rose, you know, she talks about the, 
unique pressures of and expectations of a woman in that time period. And that that all struck me as authentic and well handled. So I applaud uh, Del Call and the team for that choice. I agree. So I guess in terms of now things that we didn't like. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess just off the bat, just a more general complaint that I had. Yeah. Um, there was just a lot of pacing issues I felt. Um, uh uh-huh, for sure. I haven't, there's like eight chapters or both like half an hour. So there's a lot of time in this to cover. Yeah. And I just, I felt like, especially like early on in, in the story when Aliyah, um, Aliyah Khan is first in the animus and Omar is like doing some cool shit. He's fighting people. Mm-hmm. And like in between those scenes, Aliyah just pops up and she's <laughs> like, I never liked washing machines. <laughs> And it's like this completely breaks the pace. Like, I, let me let me get into Omar like stabbing yeah. dudes, and then she's like, mm, mm, I can't do a British accent. My cousins yeah. trapped me in a washing machine. It's like <laughs> this isn't what I, this isn't the exposition I need right now. I agree. I look, Aaliyah, um, I don't think she's a bad character necessarily, but I do think no. that a lot of those those sort of monologues that would kind of come in in the middle of things, I, like. I felt like they didn't do a great job of justifying their existence. I never felt like I was yeah. learning anything really insightful or valuable about Aaliyah to justify her, like, jumping into the middle of the historical stuff. Uh, you know? Yeah. like Yeah, I mean... Sorry, go ahead. I, actually, I lost my train of thought. You go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I, well, I was just going to say, I mean, and speaking of justifying their existence, I mean, they kind of just pop up out of nowhere. I yeah. suppose this is just her internal thought. But I would have much rather, like, and and I and I'll get into my problems like with 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 Gavin's character. But I think having her express herself to like Gavin or yeah. Michelle would have been a much better way to dump all that exposition than. And and I understand it's a problem with the medium, like, you can't. Yeah. There isn't a lot of room to to have these long drawn out scenes, so you got to kind of put it in the middle of of the action. Yeah. But I would argue that having her talk to Gavin about herself and maybe trusting him a little and revealing that would have been a little bit better for her character and in, in, in the pacing probably. Yeah. Cause it would be accomplishing more than one thing at a time, which is definitely exactly. a signifier of good writing is when you can nail plot development and character development in the same scene in the same conversation. Didn't feel like they were doing that with those like Aaliyah monologues. And speaking of Aaliyah kind of interrupting things, there's a lot of moments, especially early on where like she sort of comments on the historical stuff that's happening, which I think is an interesting device and can be used really well in Assassin's Creed, but sure. definitely like it, it kind of suffers from the Assassin's Creed movie syndrome where it just pulls you out of what's happening in the moment where you think that in one moment you're hearing this historical story and then they just really want to remind you that you're actually like watching through someone's memories in the modern day. And all that that reminder is earning for them is like, a snide comment or joke from Aaliyah. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like very, very early on, you know, anything Omar does or says, you know, she's just like, wow. She kind of, she kind of just interrupts the dialogue a little bit. Yeah. So So as far as the modern day goes, there's kind of a lot of things wrong with it. (laughs) And I want to talk about (laughs) sort of what I see as like the central mistake of the modern day story. And this is something that happens in Assassin's Creed all the time where they're trying really hard to justify the story, but they're not following a consistent like plot logic whatsoever. And what happens here is the, the big threat that they're trying to thwart is that this, this woman who works for Abstergo and it's a writer, I believe is her name who Mm -hmm. conveniently happens to be like this girl boss idol for Aaliyah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I, oh, I, I just, it was not, it, uh, just the way she just name drops one person from Abstergo and that one person yeah. just so happens to be the bad guy. Is and people don't great, tend but. to have that kind of like real admiration for like pharmaceutical executives. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? it's like if, it's like if Elon Musk's lawyer yeah. was my idol. <laughs> yeah, like Anya to Ryder from what they describe of her is not is not doing things that are necessarily worthy of everyone being blown away by her. And it's not like there aren't female leadership at Abstergo. Like Isabel Ardant was around at the time, I think, mm-hmm. and, you know, like people like, yeah. Anyway, all I'm saying is yeah, very convenient, but there's a lot of convenience. Like my dad who left me also happens to be a big 
Templar guy who's working on this project, even though that has literally no causal or direct relationship whatsoever to the fact that Gavin Banks and Michelle, what's her name, have grabbed me to view my ancestors' memories. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can draw a very thin causal line there where the likelihood of your ancestor being an assassin when your direct parentage is also involved in the assassin Templar conflict that there is some relationship there. Yeah. But it's, it's it's not really really direct enough. Yeah. I mean, it's just really trying to add some tension in that last scene. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's just to go like, wow, the first person Aaliyah killed was her father. (laughs) That's what they're like. Like it's just, I honestly, I did, I did, I didn't mind that whole bit where they were like infiltrating Abstergo. No. I, I, I didn't mind it. It's just like I also felt like when Aaliyah was describing her relationship to her dad and the way that she kind of like daydreamed about like if she'd met him, what she would say to him, what she would do. That's all super authentic and very like legitimate character stuff, and I appreciated oh, yeah. that. I was For disappointed sure. that all it led up to was like. I'm your daughter, you piece of shit. No, you're not. And he's no, like, you're not. what are, no, you're not. And then she kills him and he's like, <laughs> and he's like, I'm sorry, Aaliyah. I should have been a better father to you. Like not in those exact terms, but basically. No, no, no. That's pretty much what he does. Yeah. He's bleeding out and he's like, I'm sorry. And it's like, you're, no, you know, you're not. No, if you're you not. Were, if you were an actual piece of shit deadbeat father and a Templar villain who's just died, I think your last words would be closer along the lines of "fuck you." Yeah. And then all that or you really get off. from Aaliyah after it. Never mind the fact she's like killing a person is one thing, killing your your father is definitely another thing. I feel like her reaction to it afterwards, like, "Damn, that shit sucked." <laughs> like, yeah, she was just not a, a little great, moody. But but little moody and that's it. But exactly. Um, But back to the thing that I was trying to say earlier. So like the big risk, the high stakes of this story is that Anya to Ryder is developing a virus software thing that, Mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, will give the Templars control over the dark web. They'll be able to uh, redirect and and control the transactions that happen within it. So I believe, if I'm understanding correctly, that the big fear they have about this is that, you know, Templars would be able to intercept, like, transactions regarding, you know, say someone tries to contract a hitman on the dark web, right? And Mm -hmm. then Templars intercept that and they make it so the target is someone else or something. Or they just control the drug trade or they control all of this very vague sort of a, a, very of a vague. consequence also completely impossible uh because controlling the dark web or intercepting the the activity of the dark web is about as as logical and and possible of a thing as just intercepting all of the purchases made on the internet because really right. the dark web is just part of the internet it's just not indexed by search engines right Right. So how are they going to do that in the first place? And even if they were able to do that, what is the actual consequence that happens? Like what is what is the Abstergo able to do because they I can guess they... control the dark web? I know that listeners can't see me making the quotation marks with my fingers, but I'm doing that. I guess they could like incriminate people they don't like. I, I mean, yeah. it, it's not, it's not talked about. It's it not very, matter. it's not very, you're not supposed out. to think about it. All you, all you're supposed to know is that there is this very big threat. And for whatever reason, only Gavin and Michelle are trying to fix it. Also, the only way to fix it is with a password on a coin, on a coin from the 1600. Now let's think about this for a second. Why? <laughs> <laughs> what is what is the causal like, relationship between these fuckos at Abstergo saying, let's make the password for this something that was printed on a coin in the 1600s? And then how do Gavin and Michelle know about it? Yeah, it's like if you know about the phrase, you'd probably know the phrase. What, how do they know? Oh, yeah. Well, I have this buddy at Abstergo who is like, yeah. The password was printed on a coin in the 1600s. 
<laughs> it's like a scavenger hunt, but through memories. What the, the shit kind of sense does that make? I mean, I do appreciate that they're not going back for a piece of Eden. Yeah. That's cool. Going back for information but, is a really great idea. Yeah, but it's like it, it, it almost it almost feels like like here's the thing. I think the problem with it is that the phrase in the back of the coin means nothing to the historical characters. Also, how do you as Gavin and Michelle as assassins, right? How do you go, okay, well, we have this one ancestor that there's like direct lineage access to, uh, and he was blind. How how sure can you be at all that there's even a chance that that dude ever learns the the phrase on a coin? Yeah, and what and what Gavin says is we're putting all of our like we're we're betting it all on this. We're putting all our eggs in this fucking basket, right? <clears throat> in this blind basket that might not even go anywhere. Yeah, and of course it does because they need it to. Of course it does, but. Jesus, it is. Wouldn't it have been great if she, if she came out and she didn't find it, and then you know it was over. <laughs> that would just be what happened at Unity. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> Spoiler very good alert point. for Unity. You Spoiler for Unity. <laughs> we ain't found shit. Roll I credits. don't think anyone. I don't think anyone who is listening to this has somehow not played Unity. Though. I, I I don't. I just you know. <laughs> no, I Do you know, know how I know. often it on just, my YouTube videos I've you been slaughtered for not putting a spoiler warning, and it was like. The video is titled Assassin's Creed Origins, What Went Wrong? What do you think <laughs> I'm going to talk about? <laughs> anyway, so uh, speaking of like just Gavin and Michelle, yeah. like like it, uh, I like from from the initiate stuff, um, for those unfamiliar, Gavin, d- d- it kind of was brought up and developed and within initiates when that when that happened. And uh, I always it was like, I am so excited to see Gavin Banks. And now there's finally like an actor that portrays him and whatnot. And he is like the worst leader possible. <laughs> you know, like you told his, me that his, at one point before I listened that like Gavin Banks, they really like ruined his character. And I, yeah. I don't think I fully agree. I think that the no. weaknesses, the weaknesses you're talking about, like him being stupid, they're less Gavin problems and more plot problems. Like, yeah, it's stupid to decide that Omar sh- that, that you should put all your, your, eggs in the omar basket for this problem but that's not because gavin's stupid it's because that was all that they could think of for the writers to get this for you know anthony del Cole. that was the choice that he made about how the plot should go sure i mean but just just in general like his his plan with Aaliyah is to uh is to like pay off her student loans or whatever not no sorry what he does is he gets her back into the college essentially and then she meets him, and he's like, "Hey, I'm a part of the Assassin Brotherhood. Want to join?" Yeah, <laughs> that's like that. That's his pitch, and uh, it's just. Meanwhile, I would have like uh, the the. Uh, <laughs> I felt like the Omar when he's trying to recruit Rose. I I thought he did a beautiful job of kind of explaining and justifying the Assassin Brotherhood. But you're right, Gavin's just like, I'm part of the Brotherhood of Assassins. <laughs> Do you want to join us? <laughs> And then Michelle's like, uh, gender neutral, please. <laughs> yeah, and Michelle's like, wow, you're a stupid bitch. Like, just being really rude <laughs> to Aaliyah out of nowhere at <laughs> the very beginning. Yeah, literally, she's like, fuck you. <laughs> like, and she just met this woman. Yeah, Michelle is my least favorite in this entire thing. Oh, uh, she far. is the worst. On, on a writing and an acting level, just, just very very bad character. like the same like if you go back and play ac2 and sean is like a dick for no reason but that was charming no because... it was annoying at first sean got to be <laughs> be pleasant and charming later but when he's introduced in assassin's creed 2 and he's like i don't have time for this fuck off it's like w- <laughs> fuck you dude what are you <laughs> no, who are you i i i agree with you but like i think yeah michelle okay, i agree with though. you we agree with Michelle. oh no, absolutely yeah. yes and she never becomes charming or interesting in this story. No, it, like her, she's just like I know what it's like to lose everything. Oh, dude, there's literally a moment where it's like, oh, someone pressed the Michelle tragic backstory button because that's happening now, and the sad music is coming in. And it's like when other when Omar talks about his tragic backstory, it feels that feels real, that feels normal in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And then when Michelle starts talking about her tragic backstory, it's like, why? <laughs> Who asked? <laughs> well, well, that, come on, gang. Let's thing, go too. find out who asked. <laughs> that's the thing about the whole thing 
is like she doesn't know these people, knows nothing about their cause, and then she wakes up out of the animus occasionally, and Michelle just will talk to her, or be bitchy to her, whatever it is, and it's like she hardly knows these people. Yeah. Also, it, it doesn't feel earned. No. She just wakes up, and Michelle's like exposition. <laughs> You're completely right. Also, um, <laughs> I think my bigger problem, you, you mentioned, you said that like the, the character relationships between like Aaliyah and Michelle, like it's not earned and something that's really not earned and really frustrating to me is how many times in the historical plot you have this like really cheap switcheroo of like, you know, there's this moment where they really want to convince you that Newton's actually a bad guy. They're trying really oh, hard. Yes. And you know that that's not the case from the jump. You just know. Like, well, yeah. I mean, the, the big problem with that is, is at first, Omar is like, it's not true. I won't believe it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, cool. Well, you know, because like, that twist isn't terrible. It's just, I felt. No, it's smart like, to have if, Chaloner, the villain, frame Newton right. for all of the things that Chaloner is doing. That makes sense. But then but trying Omar, to convince Omar and the audience that it's true? Yeah. It, it, no, like, absolutely. But the, the also, as Omar goes from, I, I don't believe it. And then, like, in the next scene, he's completely operating on the hypothetical that, that Isaac did it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, in the prison and everything, he's like... He killed those 12 men. <laughs> how about how about the part where he falls in love with Rose and they apparently have sex while we listen to Aaliyah and Sean banter in VR. And then after they've had this moment where she's like, I've always loved you. And he's like, yes, I felt the same. And then, um, <laughs> you know, a scene later, she's like, she's tossing throwing knives into dudes necks left and right. She's just straight up murdering. Yeah. And she's become a bad guy. And it's like, I mean, <laughs> where is this coming from? First of all, you've just been like getting punched by Omar for like a week. And now you're like, you're a badass assassin, but also you're you're working for the bad guys. You're, you're helping the bad guys out. It's like that was not a turn that felt authentic. I mean, already I felt like the love plot, the chemistry romance between Omar and Rose, like it was almost there. Like I almost totally bought it. They spent enough time with the two of them that you could kind of get in the sense of like, yeah, I see him being attracted to her. I see her being attracted to him. And then when she becomes a villain, it's like the idea that she's someone who would be willing to kill Omar potentially, like to protect her dad or whatever it was, that I didn't buy at all. And then I'm just rolling my eyes. No, none of that is particularly earned. And you, you get into a more interesting point there too is – she goes from, like, yeah, she's been being trained by Omar for, let's say, like, a week, maybe two weeks. And the only training that we see is them, like, fist fighting. That's it. And 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 why you think it's good, and I agree with you, it's good, but Omar's explanation of the creed to her begins and ends in one scene. She accepts it without any, like, apprehension. She's like, yeah, that sounds cool to me, similar to Aaliyah. I think hers made more sense to me, though, because... I bought her as a character and she says this. she's like, I want to do something important with my life. But the only options that they give me are like this dumb, boring woman housewife shit. And then for someone to say, Hey, you can be this, you know, assassin. You can, you can save the world from these evil people. I can see her being like, all right, I'm not going to ask too many questions about this. Sounds cool. Also like you're I, hot. I don't, I don't know. I disagree. I, I disagree on that. I, I just like, look, I mean, I'm not saying I wanted, like, a whole episode, or chapter, rather, of Rose, like, deciding on it. It just it seemed very quick for someone to commit their life to the assassin cause with only knowing the tenets. And he didn't even mention the most important part, of which is nothing is true, everything's permitted. <laughs> like, he didn't even, he didn't even finish the, the explanation. I liked and, that yeah, the way I, he explained the tenets, he at least gave them context in their world. Yeah, which is something that no, doesn't always happen when they talk about the creed. Yeah. Where they'll be like, I agree. you know, stay your blade from the flesh of the innocent. Duh. Hide in plain sight. What does that mean? You know, like, and he kind of, <laughs> yeah, no, he kind of I, I justifies it. And very often I feel like the, the creed doesn't actually, when you look at it on its own, feel that important. Like it's basically just like top 10 tips to be an assassin. But when you frame it the way that Omar frames it, then he can kind of, he suggests this deeper meaning to each of the tenets. And to me, that stuff worked. Yeah. And, and, and I agree. I just, I feel like, 
also, well, yeah, and I, I, I feel like him and Rose kind of had a had a very rushed acceptance of all that. And I will say, what I didn't like about Omar and Rose as well is they treat Eagle Vision as if it's a superpower. But it always has it been, is, though. No, it has yes, not. Yes, it literally is, Eagle, dude. Eagle Vision does not make you be able to suddenly be able to parkour and do all that stuff. Like Eagle Vision no. assists you, and you can see shit. It doesn't make you better a better assassin. Yeah, it does. Like the fact, dude. If you could the see fact around, she, if you could see through walls, you would be a better assassin. No, no, but no, but uh, that that's different though. Is is what is she? What's happening in in Rose's perspective is like she can literally anticipate movements. And she, like, can run across rooftops now because she has eagle vision. In my recollection, I don't remember anything like that in any of the but, games. Okay, but, but it's not that she can run across rooftops now that she has eagle vision. She's always had the the sense of it, you know, like, but she's never known how to apply it. I think that's the idea is that Omar is like, here are the ways you can use it. So, like, yeah, it's a sudden turn, but it's just sort of tapping into an ability she's always had. Look, I would totally agree with you. If it weren't for the fact that Eagle Vision has never been consistent in a, in an AC game, it's always meant different. Things. I think it's only not been consistent recently, though. And yeah, now you can literally see through the eyes of your bird, and that strikes me as a lot less realistic than the way Rose uses Eagle Vision in this. I I just yeah, I mean, I would agree with you that it is it is a a uh, convenient gameplay mechanic, but I, I I do also think that the Eagle Vision thing, it's just yeah, I'm. I mean, it becomes less rare when every assassin you play have play yeah, as has it. Yeah, and it's not even convenient. Is, it is. Like, it's not even, it's not even consistent who does and does not have it, and for what reason? Because it used to be but, this like bloodline thing, and now it's like, I mean, we're gonna be well, playing a Viking in this next game who will have Odin sight and will not have any formal connection to assassins when, at the start of the game by our by our understanding. They've definitely just given the volume of excuse me, the volume of content in the series, Eagle Vision has been played around with a lot. I, I just, originally, you know, it was like the sixth, the, the sixth sense that they hid from everyone and, and the Isu have it, but, but only certain uh, very directly related Isu, or, or sorry, very directly humans related to the Isu like can possess it. But you, I mean, you can train it because it, it's like a latent ability. You can train it apparently. But anyway, <laughs> I don't want to get too deep in the ego vision garbage. Yeah. It's just not garbage, but yeah, you, you know I what do. I mean. Yeah. I I just I, I think like the way like look <laughs> the way Omar uses it to be Daredevil. I'm not a big fan. I, I like but, that. But uh, whatever. I like that because but whatever. If, I, if ego vision lets you see through walls, how is it controversial that it lets you see? Period. <laughs> look. Okay. Sure. <laughs> when you put it like that, I'll accept that premise. <laughs> Omar, Omar, I also think, I mean, in his explanation of the creed and everything, and look, I appreciate his, his, the way he's kind of like a pacifist now, just because he doesn't want to unleash the, the monster that's within him and all that. And I appreciate Which that. Which is a, it's a, and, it's a trope and it's not my favorite trope to be like, yeah, I'm secret. But, I'm like this badass warrior, but I, I keep it, I keep it within because I don't want to, I don't want to hurt people. Right. He's dangerous, but he can control yeah. it. But the thing is, is, like, the way he explains the creed and everything, I just, like, I appreciate the pacifist perspective of the creed, and I, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. I just, I also don't know if I agree so much that, like, the assassins are, are pacifists by nature. Uh, right. He kind of presents, he kind of presents it like they're like Jedi. They, they have always had this problem in Assassin's Creed of this sort of dissonance where, like, on one hand, we are supposed to be the good guys, but on the other hand our chief means of achieving those good outcomes is with killing. And I, I think that they should lean into that and explore that. Whereas a lot of media, AC gold included kind of tries to tries to sweep it under the rug a little bit like, Oh, uh, well we, we try not to kill people, but sometimes <laughs> we have to, you know? Yes. Like just, just lean into it. Just be like, this is not morally good. It's morally gray. We're doing something that obviously it's there's no moral justification for killing people, um, no matter how many like trolley games you want to play. Right. But yes, at the same time, like you have to acknowledge that, yeah, it would be better if we weren't killing this many people or we know that this is bad, but we do it anyway because that's the choice we make and, and we understand it and we know it. But whatever. I mean. I think at the end yeah. of the day, the biggest thing for me, right, is you have the entire plot of the story resting on this completely 
unfathomable and illogical, you know, threat. <laughs> and then you have these characters where I feel like for Aaliyah and Omar as the primary characters of the story, I don't feel like they have an arc at all. I feel like both of them are written to be like cool, clever badasses from the beginning to some extent. And yeah, they have flaws, but they're never confronting or addressing those flaws. They're never changing or becoming better people. At the end of the story, the only change for Aaliyah is that like she might, I don't know, she might try to be an assassin now, which would be cool and fine, but that's about the most boring arc you can do for an Assassin's Creed character when the only thing that, that, that happens is that they decide to become an assassin. Like, for Edward Kenway, yeah, that's his arc. He decides to become an assassin, but it has so much more meaning because of the changes he's gone through where he's seen all of his friends die and he's lost the the love that that mattered to him and his pursuit of greed has returned him nothing. That is a is a story. That is that is impactful yes. change on a character. And you understand at the end why devoting yourself to a higher cause is something that he would do. Now you have Aaliyah. Aaliyah goes from, I don't know my dad. I sure wish I could pay back my investors to, I killed my dad and also paid back my investors. But as a character, there's nothing going on deeper than that. Omar starts the story as a stoic badass. You find out more about him as time goes on, and he is kind of a, an interesting character to listen to for me. But by the end, he's still a stoic badass. Like, maybe he'll train more people or, or you know, take a rest or whatever. But, again, there's no clear, visible, or in this case, audible change. No arc. Yeah, I agree with you, and I, and I think that was very well said. Thank you. I think, um, yeah... It, it, and like yeah Aliyah's big revelation is like at the end you know um everything works out she's paid off her investors you know i mean she found her dad and fucked him up and got rid of him and uh and then she's like you know i think i might be an assassin that was pretty cool and her big like arc is that she gets over her claustrophobia <laughs> Like that was her also, big character moment. Gavin implies that this whole like Prince George thing where they're going to go around like, you know, putting criminals in jail and, and returning their their stolen money. Like he acts like, oh, this is just something you inspired us to do, Aaliyah. Really? As an assassin. You never thought about that. You never before? had the idea. Like, what if we robbed from the rich and gave to the people they stole from or 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 what if? What if we held people account? Like I don't know what. That no that, that's the thing is 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 they don't allow Gavin to be smart and thinking for himself. No. He's so he's like, a plot device in character form. Yeah, he's he he's just a character there for Aaliyah to, like bounce ideas off of. Essentially, I mean it's just, and and speaking of like I. I I don't mean to jump around too much, but there was something interesting that I wanted to mention. I thought I, I found was really silly. Was like when Rose uh, makes that very very graceful turn into into villain. <laughs> and she she, she yeah that turn is handled with about the grace of an eighteen wheeler full of spaghetti careening a tight corner. Of course. <laughs> yes, very much so. Like that turn, she throws the knife. You know. And there's there's also there's no mention that they even trained with knives. So <laughs> anyway, she throws the knife in his in his neck perfectly, and Finnegan is down. Finnegan's done for. And five seconds later, uh, Omar and Nicholas or Nikolai or whatever his name is, and uh, Isaac Newton, uh, are like bantering about a carriage. <laughs> I don't know if no, you remember this, but like literally, I mean, I remember the Finnegan Finnegan's death, down. But I guess you're right; it was an abrupt yeah. turn. Finnegan is Finnegan is on the ground dead. They've just said their goodbyes, and Isaac Newton is like, "We need a carriage," and and Nicholas, I think, is is like, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take a public one," and Isaac is like, "A public one," <laughs> and Omar's like, "Isaac excrement." It's like, <laughs> oh, fuck oh, off, Isaac. fuck off, fuck <laughs> off. Okay, my least favorite thing, like my nitpick, that's my my least favorite scene, is that they're breaking into Abstergo and they've got to tie up this like janitor, and and he's like, yeah, I've got a family, I've got kids, I'm just trying to live my life, 
and and she's like, yeah, but you work for the bad guys, in it, <laughs> and mm. and of course you're supposed to, you know, think, oh, poor guy, and they're kind of doing this meta commentary on how often like these innocent guards get fucked over by these assassin escapades, which is a fair point and very true, and I would love to see that be acknowledged somewhere. Um, but then like later, of course, because you know. If the only thing that you learn about this guy is that he's got a family, that he's going to die. And of course, they're like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, we found the body of a janitor. It's like. Uh, uh, that's just emotional manipulation, and it's not even particularly effective at all. Yeah. Like I never when the only detail I learn about a character is that they have a family. And she, and Ali is like relating to him. She's like, oh, yeah, you're from where I'm from, bruv. Like. Why do I care about that? Yeah. I don't care about that. Yeah. I don't even care about you. I don't care you. about Aaliyah. <laughs> why should, why yeah. should I care about this? <laughs> like, yeah. And, so, and you can like, tell in the moment oh when they my, discover the body oh. that he thought, like, he thought he was being clever. Like, they thought this was good. Oh. And I'm sorry. It just no, was but, not good. But, like, the Michelle and, like, Sean AI relationship, Whoa. you know, like, at the oh. end, at the end, she's like, oh, they're best friends now, ain't they? What's up with Sean? I can't Sean do an accent. This? I'm sorry, but why is he here? Because uh, I am convinced that Ubisoft said, "Look, we need to get some Sean action." I don't know, this. man. They're not particularly interested in putting Sean in anything else. I don't know why they'd want to put him why in this. Would he as use, an AI. But why would If he could use Sean, why would they use an AI yeah. version? It's so weird. And I, and I, I was watching a behind the scenes like, like reading of the oh, really? lines and stuff, and and Sean, yeah, yeah, and uh. And Sean popped up, and, and I just thought it was so sad. Just to see this 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 wonderful guy that we all love. Danny Wallace. Just reading these terrible lines. <laughs> Maybe that's harsh. I just, uh, not great lines. <laughs> Again, I think Anthony Del Call is a talented writer, and I think I, I yes, want to no. know more about how this story came to be. Because if he just wrote all of this and no one meddled with it at all, that would surprise me a little bit. Because, I mean, like, he's written a bunch of things... And I've I've read some of his comics. Yeah. I think I think he's a good writer. So this just doesn't make sense to me. There's so much wrong with this story, and the things that yes, it chooses I, to to talk about. I I do agree with you. Um, it, yeah, it should be. I, I I think he I think he's a great writer. We have both read Trial by Fire. We were both really uh excited about that when that was coming out. Um, so I I I don't think that this necessarily reflects his talent or anything. It's just this something happened with this and. And there are good things and there are bad things about mm -hmm. it. And I hope they do more. I hope we do another audio drama and they do a cool setting and they get some cool cast members and they, you know, make it happen. And I wouldn't even hate seeing Anthony Del Call come back and do another one. Honestly, all I want, all that I need from an Assassin's Creed audio drama is just focus, give us meaningful stakes, give it some thematic resonance, give it some... some narrative oomph some interesting drama i don't think this is too much to ask i really don't make it feel like like it was rewarding to listen to beyond just knowing what's happening in the world of assassin's creed we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the modern day episode that we have planned but the the balance of power in the modern day assassin's creed world is really unclear it feels like the assassins are underdogs when they want them to be and superheroes when they want them to be. And so it's really hard to get a hold of what the balance of power, who's winning, you know, what is, what are the stakes? What's going to happen if we lose this battle? What's going to happen if we win this battle? And it just makes it all, all of it from the Layla story in the games to the comics, to the books, to this, all of it feels a lot less tangible and a lot less easy to understand and care about. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think they used to have a much tighter grasp on that. So I guess to kind of sum this up, a lot of promising things about AC Gold, a lot of things that, that are likable and, and, and good about it, but on the whole kind of falls short in a lot of really important narrative senses. And uh, so on the whole, I give it like, like a five out of 10. Maybe a four and a half. What do you think? Uh, out of ten, uh, I'm gonna have to go with like a two. Really? Uh, no, I'm I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I would say I would. <laughs> it wasn't so, like completely incoherent. 
No, yes. <laughs> I, I think I'm more in line with your rating. I, I, I'd I say a, a four and a half. Yeah. I, okay, I'll give it a solid five. I'll give okay. it a five. Really? All right. Yeah, I think, yeah. Because I thought I liked it more than you did. But maybe, you know what? I think what it is is I enjoyed it more than you did, but I think less of its quality from a critical perspective. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening um, to this episode of the Hook Blade podcast. I have been the Hook. And I have been the Blade. Again, titles which mean nothing, but simply serve to make our podcast title make sense. Thank you for uh, listening to this episode of the Hook Blade, and we will catch you next time. And the blade, so you can use one or the other. An elegant design. Elegant design. design.